I always like to do the hair myself. I don't think other people really appreciate it. My hair is like spun gold. It really is, oh, oh, that's a bit much, and it's still the jacket will cover that. Mm, I said to the makeup girl, she wasn't exactly easy with the flattery. I said to her, I don't want a lot. I mean, I don't want, it's just a touch up, really, to cover the acne. You know, I'm ablaze with the acne. I said, just a touch up, not a lot of makeup. She said, makeup, you're more a paper hanging job. I thought, oh, it's a bit much, isn't it? And the ego was around the ankles. I said to her, I would remind you, I'm a cult figure. She said, yes, you'll probably attract a cult audience. I said, oh, yes, I wonder what sort of house they'll get. I should think it'll be a cross-section of the cognoscenti, I should think so. People in the know, a few pros, probably. Yes, I should think they'll get a nice cross-section. Hope there's some girls wearing pretty dresses. I was that's glam, don't you, a few pretty dresses in an audience. Mm, let's hope there are people with an appreciation for the finer things of life. I certainly happen to be one of them. Oh, are you kidding? Mm, <laughs> Mr. Kenneth Williams. What an honour it is for you to have me here tonight. <laughs> and we're going to begin in a very relaxed fashion because that music they played has a particular, a particular affection as far as I'm concerned because it was the music that was first used when I came on doing my own number in a show. You know, I, I did impersonations for an army show, actually. It was um, one of those army reviews we did in Singapore uh, with uh, CSE. That was Combined Services Entertainment. And the compare said, and... That song, he, he, he actually had a, a voiceover saying, that, that number, Stairway to the Stars, introduces Kenneth Williams with the voices of the stars. Which I thought was lovely, I love that. <laughs> and, then I came, and then I came on and did these impersonations, you see. I, my impersonations were Mabel Constantiros <laughs> and, and, and Felix Aylmer. <laughs> Stanley Baxter said, nobody's ever heard of him. <laughs> a ludicrous way to open a show. And um, so I did it, I sort of leavened it by putting Winston Churchill in the middle. <laughs> so, so I started off, I started off saying I was doing Mabel Constantino. My impression of Mabel Constantino is, oh, hello, I came ashore in my bullshit. And they said, are you one of Wingate's boys? I said, no, I'm one of Colgate's girls. And he has the to prove it. <laughs> and then I followed that up. Followed that up with this, uh, this Churchill saying, we shall fight, we're on the beaches, we're on the landing ground, yeah, 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 where we, we shall never, we shall end up. Which I thought was quite good. <laughs> and then I finished up, you see, with this, with this one, um, Felix Aylmer, saying, um, my impression of Felix Aylmer, mm, it was long ago remarked. It was long ago remarked by an infant divine. And yet all the public know of a man is his reputation. Yes, to his character, God alone, you know this. And they didn't understand it at all. And, uh, and they said, you did quite the wrong thing to the troops. Quite the wrong things for the troops, they said, you see. I mean, they were all doing different kinds of acts. Peter Nichols was doing a thing. He came on as a sort of convict. Is Peter Nichols here? Peter Nichols... Oh, there he is! I bet you don't remember. Do you remember, Peter, that number you did? It was called Condemned to Die. Yes. He came on... You won't remember the lines. Don't remember any of the lines, do you? No, I'll right. do them for you. I'll do... I'll do them. <laughs> he came on, he had this... Con he had this... Um, I knew their lines. I could have understood it. He okay, had a convict's uh, set, uh, uniform with all these arrows on it. And he, it was called Condemned to Die. And he said, they will lead me out in the cold grey dawn and I shall see the rope swinging backwards and forwards. That was it, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. And I shall see the button. 
I shall think of my old grandmother swinging backwards and forwards <laughs> in her rocking chair on A deck. I never understood that. A deck. <laughs> Something to do with troop ships, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah, that's right. And he said she had a long nose like the Malay Peninsula. <laughs> and there was a wart at Singapore. <laughs> she had a long hair on that wart. It used to crack like a whip every time she sneezed. <laughs> I remember one day she took an extra pinch of snuff and knitted herself about a cloud of helmet. <laughs> I remember that very much. And Stanley Baxter, Stanley Baxter, Stanley Baxter was doing a sort of kilted Scot, and I had, at one point, to do a, a patter act with him. And he had these lines. He was a Scots kilt. For some reason, he always did it in North Country. I don't know why, but he said, you know, in Egypt, they're so honest. You know, Cairo, as you go in on the left, there's a lamppost. And I had to say, yes, of course. <laughs> of course. He said, well, on that lamppost in 1940, I hung a watch. And when I went back in 1941, it was still there. And I had to say, what? The watch? And his line was, no, the lamppost. <laughs> and, and on the night, I said, what, the lamppost? <laughs> <laughs> if, looks could, if looks could kill. <laughs> and there we were, doing all this in Singapore, and we were stationed at Nisun. It was an army camp, a transit camp, and yet we were all ostensibly entertainers, though we... We were all in the forces. Peter was in the RAF, Stanley Baxter was army, I was army. We were all army, but Stanley we was supposed to entertain. And the OC lined us up and said, now, because you're entertainers, I understand they had to all act, that's fine, but I, I want you to go about behaving like soldiers. I will not have a lot of this effeminacy and mincing about. <laughs> and you could hear in the back row, get the madam, you're quiet. <laughs> Don't try that on with me. I was with Ivan Avella. You can't teach me anything. I know about the prayers. <laughs> Heaven knows what he did with Ivan Avella. <laughs> and, uh, and there was all this anger about any kind of effeminacy. And our opening number in the review was we all had to come on, you see, singing, We are boys of the service. We're at your service, entertaining you. One of those sort of openings, you see. <laughs> and he watched this. They're oh, dreadful. Dread boys of the service. Dreadful is too effeminate. And all those sibilants. Boys of the same. It's terrible. No, let's make it men. <laughs> men of the service. I'll go back off and come on again and sing. Men. So we all came down. We're men of the service. <laughs> he said, uh, ah, yes, that's more like it. Yes, he said. Turn your old fellow men. And uh, then he called, he called us all for a parade and said he was bringing in a tough man from the Durham Light Infantry. So they're going to lick some discipline into you. Man from the Durham Light Infantry, Sergeant Major, is going to lick some discipline into you. So we were all frightened to death and this man came and joined the company. He was the Sergeant Major. And as time went on, we found out there were one or two little fiddles being done with the Sergeant Major and the Chinese tailors in Singapore. And he was eventually caught by of all things, it's not so weird. He was caught by the conjurer in the show. <laughs> I just thought much of his conjuring, actually. And then I found out afterwards that he was SIB, he was a Special Investigation Branch, planted to find out what was going on about these astronomical bills. And the bills were very high, because Sergeant Major was doing a deal with the Chinese tailor, saying, charge 500, we'll have to split the rest between us. And so he was caught and on a charge for embezzlement. And the next thing was, he uh, took poison and the Sergeant Major was dead and the O.C. lined us up and said, well, look here, Sergeant Major's killed himself. The man's more trouble dead than he was alive. We're going to bury him. <laughs> and all over six foot, stand forward for Paul bearing. And Sandy Baxter went down. <laughs> went right down. No, nobody wanted to be a Paul bearer. And uh, the old man came along and said, we all do. It's our new Church of Scotland. <laughs> The, um, the old man said, oh, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. Yes, of course, I understand. And then went on down the line. Then he turned me, said, just a minute. We're talking about gentlemen, you berry people, come on. <laughs> so he got him and the pianist and one of the dancers, and they all had to parade and go with this coffin to the cemetery, uh, the British military cemetery, and the monsoon was falling down. It was actually pouring down, and they had this flag on the coffin. And the vicar said, get it off, get the flag off. Ignominious death, because ignominious death, you give no battle honours. So it had to be God. And I said, oh, yes, I'm sorry. And all get this. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And then this man was standing there with all this cassock flapping and this terrible monsoon. So, man is born a woman and his life is grief and full of misery. He comes out like the corn and is cut down like the corn. And there is no... And the O.C. of Dura is very fine. It's very fine. Very beautiful. In the meantime, in the middle of this you know, um, incarceration, the car, enormous Packard arrived with a Chinese chauffeur, opened it, and I've got a lady. He held an umbrella over, and she was crying, invisibly. <laughs> and the old man was staggered. Who are you, you see? <laughs> Suddenly, this woman appeared, and she said, I was his wife. We didn't know. He'd married this woman secretly in Singapore. And um, the old man said, Oh, my dear, it's really upsetting for you. I said, oh, yes, well, come. I'll take you back uh, after the funeral. I'll take you back to my head, my quarters, and we'll have a little drink here. We'll say, look after you. We'll need a little brandy. Pull it together. Yes, I need something. Just crying. And um, <laughs> I wasn't present at the rest of it, but Baxter told me that she was ensconced in the HQ. He said, oh, she was sitting there in a kimono the next day having the coffee, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, they, they said it was a morning as brief as Clytemnestra's. Clat well, it was quite staggered. And then we did, these, we did these tours, you know, we toured all over the place with these shows and were taking with our shows quite a number of civilians. There was a lady who was saying it's a grand night for singing and with the opening of the show I was with. And she, we were all told, you know, be very careful when you're touring in Malaya and Burma not to have any, uh, don't have anything to do with these itinerant peddlers. And they used to come by along the railway trains offering you um, melon, watermelon. And this silly girl <coughs> ate the melon, you see. And it was grown in typhus infested water, so the consequence was she had the most dreadful dysentery. And, and the grand night for singing number was distorted. I think. <laughs> And they, she kept rushing on, you know, they, it's great night for singing. And, then, and um, she they fixed up a commode in the wings, but uh, we, we were all left there, because we were all the chorus around going, la, 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 la. We were all la-laing, and we were left while she shot off to this commode, and we were going, la, la, and filling in like mad. And then she came back, but did it in another key. The whole thing was absolute disaster. And there was a civilian dancer called Barry Chat, who had the most extraordinary effect on the military. When he arrived in, the, in Burma, he was at the HQ, he was standing outside, and outside the HQ were several generals, brigadiers, with rolled up maps, you know, and field glasses, all standing there outside the HQ. And this dancer, Barry, did a pirouette about six times, vast, and very vast indeed, and then tapped this brigadier on the shoulder and said, tell your mother we're here, dear, put the kettle on. <laughs> <laughs> that was the sort of thing one had to cope with. And when we got to Hong Kong, which was where I left, you see, because that was our last date, and I was being demobbed from Hong Kong. And we, whilst in Hong Kong, were asked to take part in um, an adaptation on radio of The Death of Nelson. And it was rather moving, very beautiful. And Stanley Bax was playing Hardy, I was playing the French secretary. Peter Nichols couldn't be in it because he had to go to hospital. He was always going to hospital, Peter Nichols. <laughs> I think he was getting out of it, really. And then we did this show and uh, this dramatisation of the death of Nelson Trafalgar, and the Admiral of the fleet, Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser, was the narrator. And he came out after the broadcast and said, it was very moving, very fine, and I'd like you all to uh, come back on the flagship for drinks. And we said, oh, yes, very nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> And we rushed. We were all in white shirts and trousers, the khaki drill. And we went in his motor, flying the pennant of the Admiral uh, to the dock gates, where the sentries all bashed the rifles and presented arms. And they were taken on a launch out and then up the ladder of the Belfast as cruiser, which was his, ba his um, flagship. And there were stewards there, you know, and Ensign saying, oh, Ping Trian, right, Ping Trian, Ping Trian, Ping Trian, Ping Trian, Ping Trian, Ping Trian. So thank you very much, Ping Trian, yes, Ping Trian. And we were standing there in the wardroom, loving it. And they said, oh, are you enjoying life on the colony? And we said, we don't live here. We're in the, ar we're in the army. Is it? <laughs> what? What is your rank? And I said to Sergeant, and Baxter said Sergeant, and uh, Sergeant, because we were in an officer's wardroom. Well, the drinks were out of our hands and about... <laughs> Ten seconds flat, and we were over the side and bundled off with no ceremony at all, no piping, nothing like that. And when we got to the dock gates, nobody presented arms. Baxter said he heard a raspberry, <laughs> and um, and that really—I mean, I know it sounds weird, but it all actually happened. I mean, anyone, anyone here doubted? Does anyone here? You, you're looking doubtful. Do you, do you think it happened? 
I mean, I don't mind having any questions about army at this point. Because it is an audience with a, a question about army. Ah, there's Brian. Brian Forbes. Yes, Brian. You have a question? Well, not a question so much, Ken, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested because we were all in CSEU, wasn't it? Yeah. Did you think at that time that you were going to go on and make a career out of it? That's interesting. No, because you see, my old man, my father. <laughs> no, well, my father, you know, my father was a head. He said, and he'd been in the army, and he said to me, You've got to have a trade, boy. It's no good going, because I said, I wouldn't mind doing a bit. Acting is rubbish. All the women are tarts, the blokes are poofs. You'll never, <laughs> never make any money, because it's too hazardous. You've got to have a trade, boy. You must have a trade. It was all dingy. You've got to have a trade. So, of course, I'd been a trained draftsman. That's how I got into the army. I was in the REs as a draftsman, you see. So that really does answer your question. I had no idea at that point I was really doing it in the army, because I thought, well, it's a good way out of square bashing and all that awful, you know, drilling and rushing with bayonets and going, ah, and screaming. I could never do it. I could never do it. And, uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Um, so when it came to going home, they all went to Singapore, but I stayed on the boat and went to England. It was the Devonshire. That was the name of the troop ship. And on the Devonshire, when all the rest of the crowd had left, I organised entertainments, because the OC troops said, you're OC, you can get together with what talent there is on board and organise entertainment. I'll, I'll put a notice up so you can volunteer. And among the volunteers was a boy called Durant, Ted Durant. And I worked with him much, much later at Coliseum. A pad of mine with Tommy Steele, Cinderella. And a lovely boy. And he was a trained clown from Bertram Mills Circus. I'm brilliant at falling and had a marvellous clown with a great, uh, you know, red nose stuck on. And he used to do wonderful you know, tumbles all over the place. And we were performing, you know, the Bay of Biscuit. The ship was all over the place. And we were doing three shows a day on this uh, promenade deck. You could hardly hear any clapping because it was so cold, the troops, and they wore gloves. <laughs> and so it was all terribly muffled. You know? <laughs> and, and we did these sketches in a sort of review, and he played in one of these sketches a uh, part of a Russian. He was covered in fur, and every time he entered, we had somebody throwing a lot of paper for snow over him. And there on the set was this old lady with one of the nurses on board. We got her to play it. She was an old lady, and she was in this chair, you see, and and she was covered in, in white, white makeup and looked terribly ill. She was supposed to. And she sat there looking terribly ill. And he kept coming on, saying, Mother, come away to the hills. There is Pushnov, Krakow, and Marakov. They will save you. Come away to the hills, Mother, before it is too late. Come away to the hills. And she said, I cannot, my son. I am too ill. And then there was a great chorus singing the Volga Boatman. Oh, <laughs> all that said, go, oh, oh. And then he came back on and said, Mother, come to the hills. There is Pushnov, Krishnov, Trakov, Krakov. And all these offs went on. And she said, No, my son, I cannot. I am too ill. And he rushed off again, and the chorus went, oh. And they all sang, you see, very fervently. And then he shot on for the last time. Mother, come to the hills. There is Pushnov, Krakow, Mirikov, Farakov. Come to the hills before it is too late. Oh, no, my son, I cannot. I am too ill. At which point I came on and wheeled her off, saying, we'll have to discontinue. This woman's obviously far too ill. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, yes. It's a riot, isn't it? I never find out. I never found out who wrote that sketch. <laughs> but I'd like to find out. <laughs> yes, well, of course, after that, it meant coming back to London. You see, well, the, the first part, leading role I had, was in St. Joan. I played the river, and uh, the uh, St. Joan, St. Joan was played by Siobhan McKenna. And I remember this very well, this production, because in the Chinon scene, the bishop had this great diatribe to Joan, saying, you stand alone, utterly alone, the Dauphin will not help you, the bastard of Orléans will not help you. He told you, you stand utterly alone with your own impiety, your own arrogance, your own self-willed pride. And, um, and she had this speech afterwards, very moving, about if I go through the fire, I will go through it to their hearts forever and ever, so God be with me. And it... The whole thing depended on, on the furor that was aroused by this great, you stand alone, utterly alone, with your own ignorance, your own impiety, your own arrogance. And on this particular night, this old boy playing this bishop, covered in cloth of gold and the mitre and this great crook, he forgot everything. I mean, he said, uh, you're, um, 
got on your own. You are. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, yes, well, um, you're, you stand, you stand, uh, they've all told you, you stand on your, you're on your own. And, um, oh dear, what is this? And he went. He went to the prompt corner. What is it? What is the line? She's got the... Thank you, dear. You said with your own party, your own arrogance, oh, well, thank you very much. It was very kind of you. And they said to the house, I'm sorry about this. It was a very difficult play. Very difficult play. Just... <laughs> so, just bear with us, you see. A very difficult play. And meanwhile, Siobhan was standing. I um, mean, and she was starting to laugh, you see. <laughs> and it ruined the scene as far as she was concerned, because then, then her bit about my go through the fire was all for her lost, and she came off furious. I mean, I'm going to see him. I'm going off to his room. I'm going to have it out. I'm going to have it out with him, you see. And she was really very angry. And she was going to go out to see him. And Frank Roy, this old boy, he was all in this cloth of gold, and boiling hot. And he so he was relaxed, you know, he was relaxed in the dressing room with this with all this gold up. And this night. Uh, it was boiling hot, and he used to put, put the, the legs up, you see. And, yes, uh, I'm afraid there wasn't any underwear. And, <laughs> and she went in there full of anger and came out quite quickly. And I, I said to her on the stairs, do you have it out with him? She said, it's out already, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then... She always made me laugh because she took me to an Irish restaurant she loved, and, and this boy gave, her, gave us drinks first. And, um, and then we went upstairs to eat, and he came to the table to take the order. And seeing that he was doing two jobs, she said, Siobhan, oh, are you doubling? And he said, no, Tipperary. <laughs> and then after that, do you see, because Orson, Orson Welles had been to the, to this play, as he did, I mean, quite impressed by me because of the, he said, the contradistinction between two characters. I played, you know, the Dauphin as very young, and uh, when he becomes the king, as very old. Oh, they are, oh, ain't very old. Slightly common king, actually. <laughs> <laughs> he was quite impressed by it and said, I'm doing a production of Moby Dick, my own adaptation of the Melville novel. I'd like you to, to be in it. There are lots of parts you can play. I said, oh, yes, I'd love to. So I went into it playing all these different parts. And I had about half a dozen parts in that. I was a lookout at one point. I had to keep running up and down and saying, she blows <laughs> a grey white spout. This grey white spout stuff. It's all about sperm said in Wales. <laughs> wore me out, you know. I was all rushing back and forth because that was supposed to be the lookout very high. And so I was shouting very high. Then coming back for this old uh, prophet that had uh, to be the voice of doom and say, don't he board her. Oh, to ship. To ship a cursed, a cursed, don't eat border! I was worn out with all this. <laughs> great white spout and don't eat border. And Gordon Jackson, I think he's. Yes, I can oh, see him. Yeah. Gordon Jackson. Do you remember you were playing Ishmael? Yeah, I'll never forget. Yes, at rehearsal, he had to come forward and say, Call, call me Ishmael. Long ago, I had a dream. And there was a long speech about sailing the seas. And he came on at rehearsal and said, Call me Ishmael. And, and Orson shouted, If a man answers, hang up. <laughs> We all laughed. We laughed a lot, didn't we? Yes, we did. And do you remember the night he put the cuts in? Oh, don't mention it. <laughs> Those cuts. Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden, he put these cuts in. And really, we had no idea. I was playing this carpenter, and I had a long scene with him, which was all about black and white, and he maintained the Melville lines about black and white were a plea, didn't, didn't he, Gordon, yeah. for racial toleration the black and the white. The, there were all these lines about the black and the white. And I had to say, uh, the leg would be made of ivory, the whiteness of, I uh, white ivory, and the whiteness of brides. And I had to kneel to do this leg, say, oh, picture a leg for you. Oh, no, Captain, <laughs> Captain Ahab, yes. Uh, make it of ivory, the whiteness of ivory, the whiteness of brides, all in white, the ermine majesty of justice. Oh, the white, the whiteness of the ermine robes. And I was going on and on. <laughs> and in the middle of it, it was quite a long scene, in the middle of it, he leaned over and said, get off. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it, was, um, it was open stage production. There was no set. No set, no set at all. So you could be seen, so, so uh, there was no, no way to hide. So I got up and I did, the, oh, well, uh, yes. <laughs> Good luck and God bless you. I was doing God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. And may you sail, may you sail uh, uh, the calm waters and rubbish. Rubbish just to get off. <laughs> you see, and then I got off and, 
and you had to stand in the wings and freeze. They said, when you're in the wings, freeze, and then the audience won't look at you. you see. <laughs> <laughs> They did. Stuff comes off on your clothes. And um, so I was, st I was standing there freezing, you see. And uh, Joan Plowright was standing next to her. She was Pip the cabin boy. <laughs> and she said, what, what, what happened? What happened? What happened? And I said, you told me to get off. <laughs> she said, you're joking. Get off. I said, yes, and get off. <laughs> well, oh, charming, isn't it? Be a nice way to behave. I said, yes, oh, big scene, cut 20 minutes. She said, oh, it's outrageous. Your whole scene gone. I said, yes, I'm gone. It's gone. <laughs> she said, oh, who's next? I said, it's you. She... <laughs> well, she shot onto the stage. It's like a bat out of hell. She rushed on. She was playing Pip, this cabin boy, and she had to say, Captain, put thy hand in mine, the black with the white, thus shall whiteness become blackness, and black become whiteness, and all blackness shall be white, and white shall all be black. It's part of this thing about the racial thing, you know. Again, so she'd rush on and do this. Well, she was in a terrible panic. So she shot on, and Billy Chappell had said, go between Orson's legs and, and make the crucifix sign. Do you remember? Of suffering. He said, do it like that. So the black and the white, you see, and suffering. Make it the whole thing suffering. Ah, oh, cat, and put thy hand in mine. So she shot on and banged into him. And he, oh, he said, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and she bawled out, put the black and the hack and the hand in mine, the black and white, and black should become whiteness, and whiteness should become blackness, and blackness should become... <laughs> And it sounded like a sort of mad advert for Omo. <laughs> and then, of course, I mean, the first night we'd all been, it was about three and a half hours, been there till about half past eleven, and the next night we were all out and in the pub by nine. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable to take it. that Billy, Billy Chappell it was, who said, you sing rather well, because I was laughing about the wings, you know, and singing. And I do sing quite charmingly. And <laughs> you sing rather well, why don't you all come into this musical I'm doing? So I did, and that led in a roundabout way to review. And so I went into review with Maggie Smith. I had not met her before. I'd only seen her. I'd seen her in Oxford 8 and thought she was marvellous. And of course, I remember thinking at the time, review does produce a highly eccentric sort of performer, I mean, a very stylized performer, and certainly Mags was. And the same applied to Finetta Fielding, who was the leading lady in the next review I did, which was called Pieces of Eight. And that had some incredible sketches in it. And I had one which has got weird reverberations going for it, because years after this show, I was in Covent Garden trying to get drinks at that crush bar, and somebody ghosted me from behind, and I thought, oh, it's an old actor's trick. I, I'm not going to turn around and be horrified, say, how dare you, so I just ignore it. And then this goose came again, and I was forced to turn, and it was Judy Garland. Uh, I was absolutely staggered, and she said, how's your asp? And I, I, I said, I beg, beg your pardon, because it sounded rude. She said, yeah, your asp, I've got your record. I play it and play it, the grooves now are worn out. And then she started talking about this asp sketch which was a sketch I did in this review. It was a little man who sat... Oh, here, yeah, there's this sort of thing. This sort of thing. It was a little box he had. And he sat and he said, I've got a viper. <laughs> I've got a viper in this box. <laughs> it's not an ass. Oh, no. <laughs> Some people think it's an asp, but it's not. It's a viper. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's not an ass. Cleopatra had an ass, but I am. I mean, some people think that asps are easier to run, but they're not. Oh, no. And my viper, my viper's not easy to run either, my viper. Oh, my viper, oh. It eats like a horse. <laughs> and the man in the carriage, the railway carriage, said, like a horse, eh? Yes, I, yes, I like a horse. I could do with a horse. But I couldn't get a horse into a little box like me. <laughs> oh, no. It's not a horse box. 
<laughs> oh, no. I'd buy per yes, but who's no? <laughs> Part of people think I've got a fish, but I haven't got a fish in this box. I can get a fish in this box. Fish would need water, and cardboard is not waterproof. <laughs> oh, no. I haven't waterproofed cardboard yet. <laughs> well, if they have, they haven't told me. <laughs> and he went on and on and on about this asp and this... Um, <laughs> this um, I remember all of it now because it was a, it was a very long piece, but um, it was very very popular and remem people remembered that I think for the reason of, of it's, it's obsessive. It was obsessive writing. I mean, a man obsessed with one one single object, and that pervaded a lot of the writing because there was another sketch about a blimp who uh, was appalled at the fact that in an English restaurant everything was foreign, and he couldn't stand all this foreign muck. And um, there was a marvellous opening, because the waiter said, uh, good evening, I came in with this girl to have this dinner. And the waiter said, good evening, uh, a tab ta table a deux, uh, what table for two? And uh, my line was, what do you mean a deux? A deux? Then just arrive, what are you talking about, a deux? <laughs> and um, that was the beginning of the sketch. And then he offered various French things and Spanish things, and he objected the man strongly to everything. And said, I oh, none of your Spanish muck. A lot of dirty old bishops trying to do their filthy hands on Gibraltar. None of that for me, thank you. <laughs> Would you like something? Hoffratsch and Spargel Grimou. What's that? It's flown from Bob. Bon! Bloody boss selling you their second hand vegetables. One minute they're bombing you, the next minute they're selling you their second hand vegetables. I will a boss muck! And he got very angry about that too. And eventually, the waiter couldn't satisfy him because all the things were either French or Spanish or German. So he said, oh, let's have something safer or a cup of tea. A cup of tea, yes. And the girl said, yes, or a cup of tea would be nice. So they settled for a cup of tea. And then, of course, the tagline was the waiter saying, Indian or China. <laughs> and, and the man exploded with anger and that was the blackout. And I did this sketch because we were asked by CND to take part in a charity raising performance with Sheila Hancock. Not the girl I'd originally played with, Sheila. And we sat there doing this sketch, do you see? And of course, um, you know, not in your own theatre and somebody else's, you were relying entirely upon their technicians. And when it came to a French or uh, the Indi Indian or China tea line, uh, the blackout should have happened, you see. I was supposed to explode and there was blackout. No blackout came. And we were sitting there, you see. <laughs> and uh, he said, Indian or China. I said, ah, 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 well, uh, no, 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 no. I said, how dare you? What do you mean, Indian? It is English. It's grown on the Cotswold Hills. Oh, oh no. Oh, I've seen it growing there. My old grandmother, my old grandmother. Up there she was, picking it. You remember, you remember. I was desperate. I turned to Sheila Hanger. You remember my old grandmother on the hills? She said, oh, silly old cow. <laughs> was absolutely flabbergasted. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I said, you're after, why'd you say that? She thought, well, I was desperate. I didn't know <laughs> what to do. You kept on about this grandmother. I thought, well, you kept on about it, because I was like, my grandmother, you remember my grand... And she got manic, too, and said this line, which was vaguely insulting. Well, not vaguely, it was very insulting. <laughs> and, um... We sat there in the wings, moaning about it all to the electricians, and then we saw this lady go on, sing, she was in a crinoline, sing, she had all the verses of the song written on her cuffs. She didn't know them properly. And she was singing this song, I won't be a nun. Oh, I won't be a nun, I will live a life of pleasure. And the chorus is, I won't be a nun, no, I won't be a nun. And she was singing this song. And this audience at CND was a very religious one. There were lots of bishops and people. And these bishops were all in the front row. And she was saying, come on, come on, all join in. And these, <laughs> these old bishops were, I won't be a nun. I won't be a nun. Oh, uncomfortable. <laughs> so then after that, you see, I did do a whole show with Sheila. It was called... It was called One Over the Eight. And while I was doing that, I was running backwards and forwards while I was doing that, because I was um, coming from... That was the Duke of York's. And I was coming from um, the Playhouse where I was doing Hancock's Half Hour. And uh, Hancock's Half Hour was my, my first real um, radio series, you know, long series. And um, I was four years with Tony. And this particular 
they knew of players there, so she's not with really it anymore, I think it's empty. Um, there was a, a break in the pipeline, you know, couldn't get the recording line to Broadcasting House, so they said, would you fill in? So, um, Sid James said, we'll do the interruption gags. Well, you come on and do these lines about, you know, uh, I got a pound of meat at Covent Garden, you got a pound of meat at Covent Garden, I got a pound of meat at Covent Garden, it was only a shilling. A shilling for a pound of meat, what was it? Man, no, rotten. It was all that sort of thing. <laughs> and I had to do one of these interruption gags, and Bill Kerr did some, Hattie did some, and I had to run on and do the waffle gag. And I had to come on and say, I am sprinkling dust. I am sprinkling dust to kill the wild elephants. I am sprinkling waffle dust to kill the wild elephants. So then I was... Doing this sprinkling, <laughs> sprinkling waffle dust, and Hancock was to say, "Well, there are no wild elephants around here," and um, and then I was to say, "Well, this isn't real waffle dust." That was the gag. And <laughs> I know it sounds awful, but we used to go quite well. <laughs> but he was supposed to say, "What are you doing?" You know, when I did all this, "What are you doing?" And I say, "I am sprinkling waffle dust to kill the wild elephants." That's the whole point of the gag. What are you doing? I am sprinkling waffle dust. So he didn't do anything, and I was going like this. So I, I said, ask me, ask me, ask me why I am. <laughs> we all know what you are. <laughs> I got a bigger laugh than the, the original. Much bigger laugh. And then, do you see, no, it's true. <laughs> it did happen. And then, do you see, I, I got, uh, he didn't really like my kind of comedy, he said it's a bit cardboardy and stereotyped. Oh, a lot of people think that too, I don't mind. And um, I thought, well, that's all right, I'll go. And I joined Kenneth Horn, and I did, um, it was first of all beyond uh, Ken, and that was Eric Mediman and Barry Took, and then it became Round the Horn. And in the first one, there was some marvellous things, like there was always a little dramatisation where you heard somebody enact a bit, and then Kenneth Horn would have an announcement. And there was one marvellous bit where this man said, Oh, will these lights, will these lights never change? And Kenneth Horn said, You've been listening to an excerpt from Forever Amber. <laughs> There were charming little, charming little gags like that. And then in Round the Horn, the writers were different. They were Marty Feldman and Barry Took. And there were loads of very funny characters they created. And w one of their couples was uh, Jude and Sam. And Paddock and I used to play Jude and Sam. And we used to come in. And Kenneth Horn was always eminently reasonable with these two. They used to come in and say, Oh, Miss Rawn! Oh, Bernard about your Johnny Aldeek! Oh, Miss Rawn! And we're always excessively familiar. And he was always charming. Saying, well, thank you, though. I'd love to see you. Very nice. Now, I want you to decorate the place. Oh, yes, interior decor, Miss Rawn. Oh, yes. We'll shove a couple of creepers up your trellis. <laughs> right it up, yes. And we always came with mad adventures, which we related to him. And one was about yachting. And we said, I went out the yacht, Mr. Orne. Oh, Mr. Orne, this great wave came. Oh, terrible great wave, Mr. Orne. We washed overboard. I was clinging to the deck, clinging to the deck, Mr. Orne, for dear life. And his line was, did you manage to drag yourself up? And we said, no, we wore casuals. <laughs> And there were loads of characterizations for me. I, I did all kinds of characters in it. One was an old man, Grant Huddock. And this old man, they used to write him often as a very, um, you know, breathy man on the phone to Kenneth Horns. Uh, Mr. Horn, uh, Mr. Horn, can you, can you hear? Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to get my hands. I'd like to get my hands round that Judith Chalmers. <laughs> this is my line. I was always trying to get my arms round Judith Cha Cha Chalmers. Is she here? Yes, she Where? Oh, there she is. Yes. Well, you didn't mind my using your name in that way, did you? It was a, it was a, it was a compliment, you see, to your new bio charm. Tremendous <laughs> compliment. What about those wonderful ballads? I mean, where did you get them from? Did you make them up? Ah, oh, yeah, a lot of people thought that. A lot of people thought I made them up. No, it was Marty and Barry. And uh, they were very popular. They began as a sort of send-up of the folk thing, you know, because so many of those folk songs are pony, full of things like with a Phil Dilly ran and, uh, and, uh, and no, what well, those, this Phil Dilly dangles, they're all put in, really, because they can't think of something to make the scansion work. <laughs> so it's, uh, that, so they, they wrote these, all of which uh, had a basic, a good, uh, solid, traditional air to them so they went hard to learn and uh, we'll do one we'll do a Paul come over yes it's funny he happened to be here <laughs> they, always, they always had uh, they always had a 
preamble in front, you know, about, well, my dear ears, I've been dabbling in my gander bag and I've come up with a lugubrious, a lugubrious lyric that goes after this fashion. <laughs> Joe, he was a young court wangler, munging greebles did he go. And he loved a bogler's daughter by the name of Chiswick Flo. <laughs> like she was and like a grusset, and her gander parts were fine. But she sneered at his court wangle <laughs> as it hung upon the line. <laughs> so he stole a mogler's woolly for to make a wedding ring. But the Bow Street runners caught him and the judge said, you will swing. <laughs> oh, they tied him to the postern, nailed his moolly to the fence. <laughs> for... for to warn all young cord wanglers that it was a grave offence. <laughs> There's a moral to this story, though your cord wangle be poor, keep your hands off others' moolies, <laughs> for it is against the law. <laughs> Yes, well, you have to check up on where you've got to, don't you? <laughs> well, after that, I got to theatre, didn't I? I was doing an awful lot, you know. It was theatre as well as radio, and I was a lot of filming, and I was a lot of television, too, and I think I overdid it. In any case, I went into hospital, and this surgeon said, well, rectal trouble always occurs, you know, after this kind of... You're overdoing it. I said, yes, I was overdoing it, really. He said, well, no, to be ashamed. No, to be ashamed at all about the Farmer Giles. I said, well, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Mentioning it, you know, and he said, no, 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 don't worry about the hemorrhoidals, and no, we all know about the hemorrhoidals. Now, look here, nobody would be ashamed. Napoleon had piles. I said, did he? Yes, but he might be Waterloo. Not Monkey's Waterloo, and that is his sort of effect. <laughs> I, I said, it's funny you should mention that, and I played it. I did, I played Napoleon in the Anoui production on television of, of Napoleon. I know it sounds balmy, but I did. So I said to the producer, I said to the producer, what made you choose me? It's unusual casting me as Napoleon. <laughs> and he said, well, I couldn't think who to get. And they said, when in doubt, get someone funny. I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> a commendazione. And it was the Napoleon of the Hundred Days after Elba prior to St. Helena. Uh, Helena, isn't it? St. Helena, yes. And um, I wore, I tell the surgeon, I wore this huge stomach, because they said, you know, by this time he had cast name of the stomach, because he must wear this great pad. They gave me a little cotton wool down the front, so this stomach was right out, you see, while I was playing it. And it wasn't properly fixed, and during the performance, it was live, like, it was live, it wasn't pre-filmed, it was live television on BBC Two, and uh, in the middle of it all, this cotton wool went round and round and round, <laughs> until in the end, and I'd started with a huge stomach, and I ended up with a vast... <laughs> <laughs> and they wouldn't redo it. They said, oh, no, nobody will notice. We're cutting to about there, nobody will <laughs> And it went through all right. So, anyway, I had this operation. <clears throat> and then went into another show. By, by this time, I'd left Frivolous Theatre, and I was doing straight work. I was in, um, again with Maggie, Private Ear and Public Eye by Peter Schaffer. And uh, the surgeon had said to me, you know, never, never be at all neglect always clean this very thoroughly and after the show I was sitting in this dressing room with a, a sort of plastic pole and I had this warm water in it and I lowered myself gingerly onto this pole <laughs> and I was sitting there it was not the show had finished when everyone had gone and I was sitting there with this dressing gown enveloped over this pole and not came to the door and I said who is it and this voice said no and I thought somebody in the company larking about. And I said, oh, go away. <laughs> and it opened and Coward was standing there. <laughs> and he said, what on earth are you doing? And I said, ah! And I shot up. 
and the po went, oh, you know, for a bit. <laughs> and the dressing gown was soaked. And she said, what on earth are you doing? And I said, ah, oh, well, uh, you see, um, I had this operation, you know, it's an operation I had uh, with anal trouble, and I had to have an operation, and he said, say no more, my dear, say no more. I know all about the horrors of piles. <laughs> I discussed it at great length in my book, President Indicative. Have you read my book, President Indicative? I said, I didn't have piles. No, no, I didn't have piles. No, I had papili. And he said, papili? My dear, it's an island in the South Sea. <laughs> turned out, turned out he was right, it is. <laughs> and, wrong. <laughs> and we sat there and he was chatting away. And he was always delightfully encouraging. I mean, he was a wonderfully encouraging man backstage. Always said something which was constructive and really helpful as far as acting was concerned. And we were chatting away. And I said, you know, I thought of you today. It's weird you should come on this particular night because I thought of you today as I was walking past the National Gallery. You always remember. Oh, you know, that gallery always reminds me of you. And he said, what on earth have I got to do with the National Gallery? And I said, you're a lyric. We've seen the National Gallery open the Houses of Parliament burn, the introduction of income tax, which gave us quite a turn. We've seen the late Prince Consort on the magic lantern screen. What an unsuperseedable, wonderfully readable, drinkable, feedable, follow my leadable, this happy, breedable, oh, yes, indeedable century this has been. And he said, oh. <laughs> yes, I wrote it, but I don't remember. <laughs> you have a better memory of my lyrics than I have. Than I have, which I, I was delighted about. And I said, I was talking to George Rose when he was playing the apple cart when you were doing Magnus. And he told me some outrageous stories. I said, I know that's true. I said, I always like to check up and find out if they are. And he said, what did he tell you, my dear? I said, well, he said he came on after that night. He'd been to a trattoria and had moule marinier and stunk. I said, he stunk of garlic. But you're unaware of it when you've had it yourself. You don't want to worry it. And he approached Neryl on the stage for this great scene where he demands his abdication. He says, give me your abdication papers, you see. He's playing for energies. And, uh, and Coward was supposed to produce the papers, but he didn't. And he just backed away, saying, oh, my dear, please, please, my dear. <laughs> I dare don't breathe out your scotch in the furniture polish. <laughs> Actually, said with a full house there, you know, we only need a loaf of bread and we can all have a meal. <laughs> and when he told me, when he told me that, I said, is it true? He said, yes, I, yes, I said, he said, it was true. And I said, of course, he told me, he had aesthetics. He said, yes, I don't prove that. We can all do a bit of ad living on stage, especially when it's a long run, getting rather dreary. It's a good thing, but it's no, it's no excuse for corpsing. I will not have that. He was a great, great retriever in absolute professionalism on the stage. And you know, you had to know the lines, had to flow trippingly on the tongue, and he would not tolerate any kind of incompetence. And when he was doing the hay fever production, he told um, Edith Evans, you know, it's not good enough, Edith, you don't know your lines. Everyone else knows their lines, you don't know yours. And she said, it's ridiculous, no, it's quite ridiculous. I mean, I, this morning, I knew them backwards. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you're saying them now, dear. <laughs> And I, I later on worked with her in, with Edith Evans in <clears throat> Gentle Jack. And um, she'd said to Binky, apparently, I found out afterwards, why on earth do you cast Kenneth Williams? What do you want him for? And Binky said, I think he'll be very good <clears throat> as this Jack of the Green. And she said, he said, why don't you like that? He said, well, she said, he's got such a peculiar voice. <laughs> I thought, coming from her, it's a bit much. <laughs> and we started this rehearsal, so, and of course I didn't have a lot to do with her. Whenever I was on, she said, what's he doing? What's he up to? Because I was always behind, putting a leaf on the, the desk. It was all heavily symbolic. And then we got to Brighton, and I used to pop in to have a chat into the dressing room with her. And she said, why don't they come in? They hear them talking in your room. They all pop into your room. I can hear you. I can hear you right down the corridor. <laughs> and so I said, yes, well, they don't mind popping into me. They're a bit frightened of you. Something of a myth, you know. Formidable persona, as far as they're concerned. And uh, she said, I'm very ordinary, Kenneth. Really, I'm very ordinary. I sit at home with my white apron on, basting my joint in the oven. I baste with a great wooden, so I baste Johnny Dre. Johnny Dre said, my rope. My roast is the finest. My Yorkshire pudding is delicious. You <laughs> said, <laughs> what about this Yorkshire pudding? And I said, yes, well, I think you'll think of it in that light, you see. And then she said, we got a taxi back. We were both at the same hotel. And she said, did you get any notes after the show? I said, well, Binky gave me a couple, yes. Yeah. said, did you get any? She said, yes. Yes, he said, Hardy Amy's 
has designed very regal costumes, Edith. You should look equally regal in them. <laughs> and I see that look. Come on, said, it's like a sheep asleep. Do you know? <laughs> and um, she said, do you think that criticism is justified? I said, I think any criticism of your deportment is tantamount to impertinence. She said, oh, yes. Mm, you're a very pleasant young man. <laughs> Touch my knee. She said, there's no reason why the right girl shouldn't come along. <laughs> oh, that's right, yeah. that's silly, I'm 46. I said, it's a bit set in your ways. Anyway, let's go into this cold collation. So we went into this hotel where this cold collation was left for us because all the diners had theirs, what, seven or nine, but we were at about half past 11. They left one lamp on over one of the tables in the dining room. And there was this tin plate over this curled up bit of lettuce and a bit of old ham. It wasn't encouraging. <laughs> we sat in this empty corner, you see, with these tins over this old decaying salad. It was very sad, and she, this old boy that was acting as waiter and concierge of the front desk came in, and he said to her, Your partner in crime, is that her grub? The partner in crime was the advisor. She was a Christian scientist and had a spiritual advisor with her. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> the partner in crime said her grub. She couldn't wait till gone 11. I mean, you know, she wanted to get off to bed, you see. She want to drop, she want to drop her, she want to drop her something with yours. And she said, well, a half bottle of Beaujolais would not come amiss. I thought she'd fancy a drop of that. I knew you. I, I, Got a drop handy somewhere. I'll get, get a drop. And then broke wind very violently. <laughs> <laughs> and she said to me, This place has gone off terribly. <laughs> And then, yes, well, after that, after that, well, in between all those things, you know, which are, I mean, mainly theatre, I had been doing films. And it was through a review that I did the first film, which was a carry-on. I, I did other films too, but I did the first carry-on, apropos review, because the people who were casting came to see it. And I was playing uh, the sort of character in one of the sketches they liked, and they thought it fitted the uh, character they were casting for this um, carry-on sergeant, which was the first one. So I got into the carry-ons. Oh, hello, hello, it's Matthew. It's Matthew, isn't it? Yes, game for a laugh. Yes. Um, will you tell me, uh, were the carry-on films as much fun to make as, uh, as they are to watch? Because, yes, I'll tell you why, because one knew everybody. I mean, people like Hattie, people like Joni Sims, people like Charlie, Kenny Connor. We all knew each other so well that even in a scene which perhaps you weren't giving, you kept coming up the bum cue, they would help you out because they knew exactly how you were going to work the scene. And you knew their technique as well and could help them in, in reply. And good comedy, I think, is essentially like a tennis ball. It should go from one to the other, you know, without ever touching the floor. It should remain white throughout. And with those sort of people, you could do it. <clears throat> they were all, I think, after their fashion, I, I think eccentric to a degree. I mean, certainly Charlie Hawtrey was extraordinarily eccentric. <clears throat> I mean, really, I remember, <clears throat> I remember him on the set with his mum, and Mrs. Hawtrey used to come with him sometimes and have a cup of tea on the set. And they were sitting there on the set, and he was chatting away about this play he'd done. And he was telling us about playing two roles, and that he'd gone on as a lady and come out as a bloke, and so nobody knew who'd done the murder, you know, that sort of thing, and who'd done it where he played both roles. And he was in the middle of this long dissertation about playing these two roles when Joni Sims said, Charlie, your mother's... Because she'd had a fag and it dropped into the bag. Uh, <laughs> oh, open, an open handbag. And the whole of the reticule was ablaze. <laughs> and and Joni, Joni said, Charlie, your mother's bag. Charlie, 
And Charlie had his cup of tea and he said, oh, yes, and he flung the tea into it. <laughs> and, and she snapped it shut. And the whole sodden mass was confined. And, and he continued with Eric Portman said to me after that show, well, I'd like to meet that girl, because he'd only seen me come on as a bloke. And I said, darling, you've met her. And so he was uh, totally unconcerned <laughs> with his fire in the bag. I mean, it was as eccentric off as it was on, I always thought. It talked to sort of telegra telegraphies, which Joni, Joni Sims, understood perfectly. She could always interpret everything that Charlie was saying. I certainly couldn't. Some of it was absolutely beyond me. It was so codish, you know what I mean? And uh, Fenella Fielding was in one, equally eccentric, and she was in Screaming. She played my sister. And we were in a gig for one shot, and um, Gerald Thomas said to me, get very close, it's a tight two shot. I've got the camera in the shafts of the gig. So get very close and simulate, you know, pretend it's jogging, jogging up and down, you see. And get very close to her. Come on, Kenneth, get very close and do the dialogue very close. So I pushed against her and she said, why is your bum so hard? <laughs> <laughs> do you leave it out at night? <laughs> thought, this, is, this is sheer surrealism. <laughs> no, no answer, is there? Can't top it. Can't top it at all. And another very funny thing I think that happened on a set was one day when Gerald Thomas was doing a scene, a sh shot a scene which he didn't really want to shoot, it was out of sequence, but he had to do it because people had not turned up. I shall know. No, no. <laughs> but somebody was late. So he said, we'll do that. We'll finish off that bit with you and Hattie in the doorway. And it was in the scene with Hattie and me in the doorway where I was struggling and saying, no, matron, no, matron, no, please. And she was saying, go on, doctor, let yourself go. Oh, Dr. Tinkle. Daphne for me, because I'm a baritone. <laughs> and uh, she's going on about Dr. Tinkle. I was saying, no, I was once a weak man. And she said, once a week's enough for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we were about to shoot this scene because somebody else was late. And the cameraman said to Gerald, can't shoot it, Gerald, the door is actually, you can see, when they struggle in the doorway, you can see the door frame shaking. It's all wobbling, you must get a carpenter with a brace, something, it's gotta be braced. And Gerald didn't want to hold it up, he didn't want carpenters of bracing. He said, oh, just keep going. Kenneth, put your leg, hold her with one arm, and, and then with your other hand, push the door, and with your leg, with your leg, brace the door with your leg. <laughs> you can do it. Push your leg. And I said, alas, my legs are not what they were. And Gerald said, they never were much anyway. <laughs> and Hat said, don't knock them, Kenny. Don't knock it. Don't knock them, Jerry. They got him here on time today. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was delightful because Hat, I had. I mean, a great deal of affection. I mean, I adored her. She was a warm, lovable woman. And I remember saying to her once when we were doing the carry-ons, I said, you know, she knew about my admiration for Coward. And I said, one of my earliest recordings, you know, was uh, The Welcoming Land. And it's one of my 78s, and I lost it. I said, I lent it to someone, I never got it back. I've always re regretted that bitterly, because it's a lovely, it was a marvellous recording, because Coward's recording of poetry that isn't his own is really remarkably good. His standard is colossally high. Wonderful the way he did this particular poem. It was called The Welcoming Land, Clement's Dane. And um, I remember saying it to her, I thought more about it. And a year later, when I went for Christmas with Hat, on the table, we all were given presents from Hat and decorated was this recording she'd found for me. She'd been all over the place, second-hand shops, gramophone record shops, to find this 78 recording of The Welcoming Land. Mm, and it, it was lovely. I always think of her when I think of the poem because it's got some lovely lines about this land of ours, England, being a welcoming place. And he says at one point, hunted Huguenots, Jews from Spain, fled to this wise island, drew sobbing breath in easy air, and smelled the May, sweet as a kiss on a winter day. And that was what had was for me somebody who was as sweet as a kiss on a winter day and whenever i hear that particular line i always think of her in that context because she was the most heartwarming of persons and the other curious incident on a carry-on which i always remember was when phil silvers came to do camel it was called carry on follow that camel and this curious title carry on follow that camel and 
he had a lot of trouble with his contact lenses, which kept falling out. And we were in the desert, and there's both in this desert and sand, you know, and they were always falling out. And he was always saying, Can you find my contact lenses? Anyone see my contact lenses? And he was always telling us endless stories. They were very funny. Most of them had a very good tag. And he told us about being in a USO show. And he said, When we got to Rome, Frank Sinatra said, Well, I'll go in see the Pope, you can come in with me. I said, don't be silly, Frank, you can't just walk in on the Pope, you know? And he said, yeah, I can, I got a few strings, I can pull the embassy, and he said, certainly he did, and the next day, there we were, in the Sistine Chapel with one of these acolytes and a cardinal, you know, saying, come this way, the Holy Father will see you now. And he said, there we were, we actually got to see the Pope. I couldn't believe it. And he said to Sinatra, well, my son, I know you are a very fine tenor. And he said, no, 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 Father. He said, I'm a baritone. He said, oh, I'm sorry, my son. I thought you were a tenor. He said, no, no, I'm a baritone. He said, and then he turned to me and said, Mr. Silvers, I believe you are a funny man. He said, I gave him a rundown on my early days in burlesque. <laughs> He was kind of cute, he was kind of interested, you know. And his dad was talking about all this stuff, you know. And then he said to me, well, my son, is there anything I can do for you? Any favor you would like me to do? I said, yeah, I got this uh, rosary and tobacco tin. I kept this rosary and tobacco tin because I said to the Pope, I want you, I've not had anyone else touch it, I, I lift the lid of this tin, I want you personally to put your hand on this rosary and bless it because then, then I can go back, I want to give it to Crosby because I want to be able to say that it's personally blessed by the Pope. And he said, I would do better than that, my son. He said he went away and he bought back these, uh, these rosaries, which he gave me six, and they were all stamped with a Vatican seal in, in, in cellophane, they, and nobody else touched them. And he said, take those, my son, uh, one for Mr. Crosby and his wife, and I know his children. He said, yeah, I, will. I love it. Oh, thank you. That's great. He said, I was, oh, I was really chuffed, you know. I came out of there, and we are on the steps of the chapel, and, and from Sinatra gave me a real, I mean, a real, he hit me right in the stomach. You know, it really winded me. I said, oh. What'd you, what'd you do that for? And he said, you bum. I get you the interview with the Pope and you plug Crosby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, a question. a question, yes. Yes? A recent development in your career has been that you've turned into being an author. Have you enjoyed promoting your first book, Acid Drops? Yes, well, you are rather shoved around. It's worse than touring. It's worse than touring with a play, I think. Uh, but I've heard some delightful things. I heard from an authoress who was at one of her signing sessions and you know sometimes the diction isn't that good and she said this lady said Emma Chizit so she put down best wishes to Emma Chizit and then this woman said what you written in here and she said your name Emma Chizit she said I said Emma Chizit <laughs> The trouble with that writing, do you see, the trouble with writing, especially a book like Acid Drops, which is really in all about put-downs, acid put-downs, malignant thrusts, if you like, is that you remember afterwards loads of things that you wanted to put in and you didn't. I mean, one of the lovely put-downs was um, told me by Jeremy, Jeremy Swan, we were doing Jack and Ori, and he said that when Bobby Heltman was doing the... Um, the uh, dream in America. They played a stadium at one point and did the, the ballet in a floodlit sports stadium and Robert was given the umpire's room because they felt, you know, it was the most commodious room. And so he was given the umpire's room and then boy went round calling the half, you know, and knocked on the doors for half an hour and got no reply. So he went in and on a table, Robert helped him to put a chair and on top of that chair, he was standing, craning with a mirror and a makeup stick against the one naked light bulb that was hanging from the ceiling. And he said, are you all right up there? Doing this very elaborate eye makeup for Oberon. And gold and green, you see. Are you all right up there, Sir Robert? And he said, oh, yeah, I'm fine. Goodness knows how these umpires manage. <laughs> it's a marvellous... It's a marvellous reply, you know. And it is so, it is so essentially theatrical because I think actors are absorbed so often, you know, by their craft, by their, by their profession and um, have really got no interest in anything else, you know. Uh, uh, just a minute. Just a minute. I mean, uh, just a minute. Could you tell us about just a minute? Because you always seem to win it. Oh, I don't Do always. Cheat. 
I don't always. You <laughs> cheat. That's what you do. Ah, ah, yes, well, I'm afraid. Yes, I have to answer. I have to answer honestly and truthfully. I have cheated, yes. What I do is sometimes go into German because I think, well, they can't fault me on that, you see, because it doesn't say you've got to speak in English, so I can do a bit of... Ich weiß nicht, was soll es bedeuten, dass ich so traurig bin ein Märchen aus der Seite, das kommt mir nicht aus dem Sinn, because I know one or two songs. And I can wait for that. <laughs> or I do Stanley Unwin. I did Stanley Unwin on it and won on that occasion by saying, a positive thought trends right the early morning when thoughts of clarity in the mind later open that very pretty ancient British sparkles where the wax was coming in the eardrums in order to pass the siren safely with a dangly chandelier, Harry the Acres, Catherine of Arabold, which I think is the other <laughs> Catherine of Arabold. Because you feel she's there, don't you? He does his marvellous names. You feel it is the real thing. You know it is the real thing. I always love Stanley Unwin for that. And I've won sometimes on that, but that Parsons, Nicholas Parsons, he says things, <laughs> he says things like, well, I'm not lying there if your diction's appalling. <laughs> well, I said, as good as yours when you've got your teeth in. <laughs> well, and then he said, disgraceful, really, Kenneth, I couldn't talk like that. And I said, of course you couldn't, you haven't got my vocabulary. <laughs> got a laugh. Yeah. That's a great thing. So what else are we up to? I'd like, ah. Oh, so is it Ted? Yes, Ted. Ted Mould, my yeah. love, yes. I I'd like to know, Kenneth, how somebody as unique as yourself, pungent wit, every other sentence and aphorism, how do you cope with public recognition in your daily life? Mm, yes, a very good question. I mean, it would, be, it, would be, it, would be, it would be... It would be wrong to say that I've always got a snappy cash answer. I certainly haven't. On occasions, I've seen somebody carry it off with incredible aplomb. It happened when I was with Stanley Baxter because he had an open touring car and so he could see the public, they could see him, but he had the ability to depart very quickly, could put his foot down the accelerator and go. And we were we, we, he was about to, to, to drive off when on the pavement a, a man went by who saw him and said, Ah, here, don't tell me here. No, 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 don't tell me. Don't, no, 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 don't tell me. And Stanley drove off and said, I won't. <laughs> covered in carbon monoxide or whatever. But that familiarity thing can be very funny. I remember Kenneth Connor telling me he was on set. It was Trio by Somerset Maugham. And Somerset was there, you know, with an incredible dedication <laughs> in a chair with his name written on it. And they were watching the scene, which was of a dive from an incredible height and very, very suspenseful. And they were all watching the scene. And Somerset Maugham. <laughs> and this painter with a can and a brush came by and nudged him and said, Another winner there, Somerset. <laughs> and, and it's comparable, it's comparable to a story I tell in, in Estrops about, uh, about T.S. Eliot getting a taxi. And I read this in the Times. It was a letter from Valerie Eliot. Valerie Eliot wrote it about him getting into a cab and the driver pushing back the glass panel and saying, T.S. Eliot, isn't it? Is it, yes, I didn't know you would recognise. Oh, I know, I know them all. I've had them all. I've had them all in my cab. Oh, yes, I've had them all. I know them all. He said, Do you think I had any here last week? Bertie Russell. <laughs> Bertie Russell in my cab. Greatest philosopher in the Western world, right? And he said, Oh, yes, yes, right. He said, Go, right. And do you know? I said to him, Bert. <laughs> I said to him, Bert, what's it all about? And do you know the trick couldn't tell me? <laughs> Marvellous. That, that familiarity thing. That familiarity thing can go, I think, sometimes a bit far because there was a stagehand on the set, uh, the lady who was notorious for this women's lib throw away the bra. And he actually said to her, Yes, yeah, you look ten years younger. Yeah, with the breasts hanging, it's taking all the lines out of your face. There are occasions when there are occasions. There are occasions when when it can go too far, Kenneth, aren't there? Please. Yes. Hello, Kenneth. Hello, Hello. Henry. It's Henry, my darling. It is. Hello. Kenneth, of all the phases and all the styles of humour you've been involved in over the years in films and radio and television and the stage, what's your favourite? My favourite what? Style of humour. <laughs> your favourite oh. style of humour. I see. Well, I think I would I think I would go for any kind, really. As long as it is humour. And humour I think 
I think it was Wilde who said there are only three categories. Um, one is relationships, one is, is situation, and the other is linguistic. I mean, a pun, play on words or whatever. And there always is a joke to illustrate exactly that. And if they're good of their kind, I enjoy them. I enjoy them all. If they're good of their kind, I think that's the essential factor. They have to be good of their kind. It's like Wilde, you know, saying about humour. There's nothing in bad taste as long as it's funny. And the one I enjoy about situation, situation comedy I enjoy, is the one about the sailor coming home and seeing this place transformed with a carpet, magnificent carpet everywhere. And he went upstairs with carpet all relayed out there as well, and this great four poster on which his wife was lying. Uh, in a very tantalizing negligee. And he'd come home, the sailor, unexpectedly. And he was staggered by all this opulence. And by the open window was a man in boxer shorts and a bowler doing press ups. And, <laughs> and he said, uh, who's, who's paid for all this carpet? And she said, and who's bought this four poster bed you're laying on? He said, and who's brought to the negligee? He said, and who's been sending me five quid a week to Chatham? He said, him. He said, well, close the window, you'll get pneumonia. <laughs> and, uh, I, I was telling Stanley that, and he said, I would never use that tagline. I would never, I'd say, close the window, catch his death. He said, I wouldn't use pneumonia. I think it's a terrible thing to say. Bad, sounds like sickness. No, you wouldn't use it at all. And when it comes to relationships, um, the relationship that one accepts always, when it's confounded, that to me is very funny. There's a relationship one I adore about the doctor saying to the, to the couple who ask him why they can't have children, is well, I've, I've, I've really investigated your condition in depth, uh, I've taken urine, urine samples and blood samples. It's obvious why you're not having children. You, madam, have an excess of sugar, and uh, you, sir, have an excess of albumin. You can't have children, but you can make lovely meringues. <laughs> It's just, it's just the reversal. It's the reversal of, um, of identities, because you accept the fact initially that he's supposed to be authoritative, and he turns out, it turns out, uh, turns out not to be authoritative at all. It's just rubbish. But you know, it's like that Edward Bono thing about the child and the father in the in the in the car, and there's an accident, and the father is taken away, and the child is rushed to the hospital, and his father is um, is, is taken away from the boy, and then he gets to the hospital. And uh, the doctor looks at him and says, my son, and you ask the people you're telling the story to, what is the relationship? And they always say something weird, like, oh, uh, it's a priest calling the child. The doctor is uh, a priest. And they, no, 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 no. And they don't ever get it, because the simple answer is the doctor is his mother. But it's an extraordinarily, extraordinarily interesting story, because it does reveal attitudes and relationships. And, and uh, we do have fixed attitudes about relationships in our heads. The other thing, the linguistic one, comes under all kinds of categories, you know, puns. And the one I enjoy very much is uh, about this woman at the zoo and this Frenchman who's visiting London Zoo is listening. And the child says, what is that hanging from the elephant? She says, it's his trunk. And he said, no, the other end. Said, it's his tail. And he said, no, not quite the end. And she said, oh, that's nothing. And the French would say, oh, madame, vous êtes très blasé. <laughs> Because um, that is it's interesting, because it's a French, French um, tag, which, um, interestingly enough, brings me to something I've wanted to do for a long time. There's a song which I found, which is written in, I mean, apparently, you know, it, it's, it's, it's all words that are in English, whether it's a liaison, commissionaire, they're all words that are English, but it's put together as as a French, a really, a real French song. And the whole thing came to fruition for me when Gordon, Gordon Jackson, great, I always, I always say great, one of the great musicologists, suggested this charming <laughs> musical setting. He played it for me. And said it, this musical setting for the song. And it's introduced, um, a la Aznavour, which is my next song, is une chanson d'amour, a song of love. He loves her, <laughs> and she loves him, <laughs> but they cannot be married because they are too closely related. They are husband and wife. <laughs> so, 
It's called... Uh, it's called uh, crêpe suzette, which is in English is a flaming hot dish. <laughs> and uh, so is suzette. On est soit que ma pense, fait toujours reconnaissance. Mère Smith, palais des danses, <rire> badinage, ma crêpe se zèle, du blond tendre restante, Jacques Cousteau, Yves Saint-Laurent, <rire> eux et la plume des matantes, c'est la vie, ma crêpe se zèle. Crossage, massage, frère Jacques, salon, par avion, pète la claque. <rire> Fiancé ensemble, lorgnette, lingerie euh, des toilettes, <rire> oh, gauloise, ou cigarette. Entourage, ma crêpe sous Citron, mirage, carvel, eau de brut et chanel. <rires> Chaise longue, chachette et stèle. Fuselage, ma crêpe sous Pince-nez, bidet, bidet. <rires> Commissionnaire, mon repos, Brigitte Badeau. Je sens frontière et ça n'a rien à Il y a des sons dans le French. Faut pas grand prix, espionnage, grillère, camembert, fromage, mayonnaise, honnête garage, RSVP. Ma crêpe sous elle.